We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Dean Rosenthal. I'm the Fisheries Division Administrator located in the Lincoln Office of Game and Parks. I um, want to go over just a few brief things here. First off, I want to thank everybody for logging on tonight, taking their time to uh, join us in this meeting. One of the important things of this meeting is the opportunity to for you guys to share comments and questions. Uh, a little bit about the program tonight. Uh, we'll do a little bit of introductions here. Uh, we have fishery staff on from basically across the state. We have law enforcement and wildlife personnel also on. So uh, we do have good representation for various questions. Uh, a little bit of a fisheries division overview. Uh, the district will cover their district projects and fishing forecast. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, when you put your, we're gonna, I'm gonna go over just a little bit on the Zoom here so everybody understands if they're not familiar with it. Ask that you mute so the red slash goes through the little microphone down the lower left hand corner. And as we get started to uh, put a slash through your video so your video is not on. Uh, this is the chat button down here at the bottom and center of your screen. Uh, if you use that to ask your questions, we ask that you put question in front of your remarks so we know it's a question. If it's a comment, just put comment first. And then if you need to, uh, there is a reaction button to where you can raise your hand uh, if we can try and monitor for that and see if anybody's having any issues with anything and we can go through that. The important thing though is the question and answer and we want you to be very honest and open on that. I'm giving up control to you, Jeff. Tony, I'm trying to approve your request for control of the screen. For some reason, it doesn't want to work. Did I not give up control? Um, Why not? Have... Apparently, it won't let me give Tony control. <clears throat> I'd requested. I'm going to cancel. So. I'll go ahead and request yours, now, Jeff. I'll go ahead and request. There, there it goes. Okay. Perfect. Now it says I'm controlling the screen. So, um, so yeah, my name is Tony Berta. I'm an assistant division administrator with uh, the fisheries division, um, and I work in the fisheries management section, which you're going to be hearing from from the guys in the Northeast District uh, Fisheries Management uh, District there. I need to back. So I'm just going to give a very brief overview of our of our fisheries division, how we're funded, our structure. Um, if you want some more detailed uh, explanations in, in a presentation, uh, we did a statewide meeting uh, earlier, well, it was yesterday afternoon, that is going to be made available via uh, the Game of Parks YouTube page. So if, if you're looking for additional information on a statewide program, as well as other districts, make sure you check out our YouTube page for that. But this will be brief uh, before I turn it over to the Northeast District guys here. So funding for our fisheries division, we're primarily funded uh, from fishing license, or basically user fee base, uh, um, excuse me, primarily from user fees, which are uh, fishing license sales, um, Include and also sport fish restoration program. Uh, the sport fish restoration program is a federally um, established program that um, well, we have funds distributed to state agencies that, that come from excise taxes on fishing tackle, equipment, uh, boats, motorboat fuel, that sort of thing. So that helps fund a lot of our programs. We also have aquatic invasive species fees and that includes um, both our resident boater registration, um, some, some money from our boater registrations, as well as non-resident, um, our non-resident AIS sticker. 
And then we rely uh, also on different public and private partnership and partnerships and collaborations to help fund and increase the capacity of our different programs. So how our fisheries division is structured, we have uh, three main sections. We have a management section. Um, our management is uh, basically we, ha we, we have four districts that, that are um, throughout the state, our Northeast District, Southeast, Northwest, and Southwest District. And, and our staff is out there um, collecting fish, doing population surveys, um, implementing different management strategies based on, uh, based on our different uh, populate, fisheries population and habitat surveys and, and conducting, like I said, different management strategies, whether it's uh, length or bag limit changes, stocking recommendations, um, aquatic habitat enhancements, um, those sort of things. Um, within our management section, we have our aquatic habitat program. It's a nationally recognized program that's funded via our um, aquatic habitat stamp. That, that program has been um, very successful over the last 20 plus years, conducting a lot of large projects to uh, enhance our water quality and our aquatic habitat and a lot of our water bodies. Uh, we also have a motorboat access uh, and angler access programs within the management section that really help uh, um, really help get folks um, to the water the best we can. So, so not only are we trying to make these fisheries uh, um, fish friendly, but we want to make them fishermen or angler friendly as well to to create amenities for for people going out and, and fishing at at our public water bodies. We have our aquatic invasive species uh, program also within our management section, and then our private waters program as well. Um, briefly moving into our production section, um, we have hatcheries positioned uh, throughout the state. I know Jeff's gonna hit on a few of those within, uh, within the district here, but our guys in our, our production section are uh, continually um, asked to be innovative and, and really work hard at producing um, lots of fish, large fish uh, that the managers and our public uh, uh, request. Um, each, of these, each of these hatcheries um, uh, take part in raising and distributing a number of different fish species. And you know we, we raise millions of fish from 20 plus different fish species each year. And you'll hear a little bit more in, in, in Jeff and Phil and Andy's talk here about how our production uh, is really, really important to a lot of our fisheries, especially in the Northeast District. Our research section uh, coordinates statewide investigations uh, on lakes, rivers, uh, reservoirs, and streams. Um, we have our rivers and streams program um, that's within our research section as well as our Missouri River program that um, focuses a lot on our pallet sturgeon. Um, and even you'll hear uh, a little bit later on our, our um, paddlefish as well. And then we also uh, do a lot of data management, data analysis within our research section, uh, in addition to contracting uh, applied research to a number of different universities where we rely on their expertise to conduct, uh, conduct research that it directly applies to management of these public water bodies. Uh, a couple of other key components to the fisheries division is our aquatic education program. Uh, Larry Pape, he's a one man show um, running our aquatic education. However, he relies heavily on our volunteers that uh, help him put on programs. So, um, for those of you out there in the audience that are uh, have been part of this program, we we uh, we couldn't do this without you, and we really appreciate um, what you do for our aquatic education. Um, this year was a lot different. There wasn't many um, in-person type of events, but we evolved, and Larry evolved, and did a lot of different things to reach a large uh, number of folks through through other avenues. And the same same with our outreach, Daryl Bauer. He's a one-man show within our outreach. He does a lot of different things as far as um, um, looking at uh, different 
different ways to get information out to you, the anglers, whether that's uh, through seminars, blog posts, uh, being being very heavily involved in our social media, um, and and being that uh, liaison from from the anglers to the, to our to our staff. Um, he, he does a great job of getting that information out and then bringing the information back to us. And in addition, within our agency, we rely heavily and, and we work very closely with a lot of our other divisions, um, um, our wildlife division, our parks division, law enforcement, and all of our divisions within the, uh, within the agency really help us uh, make the fisheries what, what, they, uh, what they can be for their potential. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Shuckman, um, who is the district supervisor in the Northeast District, and he's going to uh, run through a lot of the different things that are going on within the Northeast Northeast District. So take it away, Jeff. Jeff, before you get started, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ken Curry. Ken has been selected by the governor to be our new commissioner uh, to replace Jim Ernst for uh, the Northeast District. Uh, so I'd like to, he is on line here and I'd really like to, if he has anything to comment with, uh, ha encourage him to uh, speak up here. Well, good uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? I don't, yes. know if, I don't know if you can see my ugly mug, but it's here. Um, <laughs> pleasure to be a part of it. I did listen to last night's uh, presentation. Tremendous job from the from the team and I appreciate the customer service and I look forward to supporting everybody that's tied in. So with that, you guys have a wonderful night. And if there's things I can do for this part of the state, I'm there to help. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate you're, it. You're welcome. I'm glad you're aboard, Ken, to listen to us tonight. Hopefully we can share some information about your district here and look forward to the chance to meet you, hopefully at the commission meeting coming up in Norfolk in March. <clears throat> so look, we're going to talk about the Northeast District, obviously. It's a pretty big district, 29 counties in the state. Tony mentioned, you know, we, we have four districts throughout the state. Norfolk is our district office, with, and we have a service center in Bassett. Um, 29 counties, rather large district. Uh, we have a great amount of diversity here within this Northeast District. Everything from sand pits on the southern part of the district, sand hill lakes on, on the western um, part, uh, irrigation reservoirs in the southwest part of the district, trout streams in the northwest part of the district, and we've got the Missouri River, the Elkhorn River, the Platte River, a ton of diversity. And it shows up with our fish species and our, and our fishing opportunities in this district. It's also a rather large area for three full-time management people uh, to keep track of. So we do as best we can. Um, and we have just the three, two of us in Norfolk, Phil Chavala sitting right here behind me, sharing the screen with me tonight. We've got Andy Glidden out in the Bassett office. <clears throat> Typically we um, get to hire an AIS technician uh, to help us with some of the field work and also our, the AIS duties I'll talk about later. But I can't talk about our district without mentioning the hatchery staff, uh, like Tony alluded to. We have, we have a fish hatchery and a fish production facility here in the Northeast. And they do a ton of work for us. If you've caught fish in the state of Nebraska, you've probably you know, reaped the rewards of what's gone on at Grover at Calamus. Calamus has, has four full-time staff out there and Grove has three up here by Royal nearby. Grove is well known for raising some tremendous rainbow trout. Those 10 to 12 inch trout you're going to be catching in about two weeks from now. A lot of those will be coming in the Northeast will be coming out of, of, of the Grove Trout Rearing Station. And I can tell you right now, they're going to be tremendous fish. They're going to provide a lot of opportunity. Calamus takes care of what we managers dream up as far as stocking is concerned. We put together our wish list. Those guys make it happen. The guys at Calamus and um, North Platte and Valentine really come through for us. So without them, we wouldn't have the fisheries we have, not only in Northeast Nebraska, but across the state. Uh, they're an integral part of the team and, and deserve a lot of credit for what we do. 
So kind of in a nutshell, that's what we're dealing with here in, in uh, Northeast Nebraska. <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about some projects that we have ongoing or completed. And Tony mentioned our aquatic habitat program. You know, in my 39 years of, of doing this job, this has been one of the, the biggest boon probably to what we do in fish management when we created the aquatic habitat stamp and, and a big thank you to the anglers out there for supporting that, <clears throat> not only getting that through, but you know, purchasing that habitat stamp, which is required by law. We've done great things with that money and we're able to partner up with other entities and use federal aid match and done a ton of projects around the state with that, including Northeast Nebraska. And you can see on the screen from 97 to, to, to 2020, a number of projects that we've done and completed, and we have some ongoing in 2021. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those, but very proud of what we've been able to do with that. And Mark Forth does a fantastic job of running that program and, and coming through with, uh, with the money for some of the projects we, that we dream up on that aspect also. First one I wanna talk about is Swan Lake. We did some work out there, that's in Southern Holt County. Probably the major improvement you'll see if you go out to Swan Lake anytime in the future is a new boat ramp. Uh, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, the lower left, the old boat ramp was basically a primitive ramp, rock and gravel that we compact and would add to it with a skid loader every so often. Go out there and clean it and try to maintain it. It's a fairly shallow lake, so it's a shallow place to put in a boat. And with the primitive ramp, you pretty much had to have a four wheel drive. <clears throat> well, there's been an uptick in the fishing at Swan Lake recently. And with that renewed interest in the lake, you know, we've been, we, we began considering a better boat ramp there. And uh, as a matter of fact, that came up in last year's Northeast District uh, Public Fisheries meeting, information meeting. And, uh, and you know, we responded to that, came up with some funding and, and did a project there our flat water group to work with us on that. And it turned out to be a very nice, simple, quick project. <clears throat> we didn't change the depth contour, but what we put in was, was an articulated concrete mat. And you can find out you probably don't need four wheel drive. You shouldn't need four wheel drive on this anymore. And uh, it's gonna be a nice gentle slope yet. We are gonna add a boat dock to this, to this new boat ramp in the spring as soon as the ice goes out. We weren't able to get that done last fall because by the time the dock was built, the lake had froze up. So we're gonna get that on that this spring. And um, we're gonna control cattails around the boat launch area, make sure we have a nice wide opening. You can see we've already opened it up, got rid of some trees and things. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be nice. Uh, people are gonna be pretty happy with that. The other thing we did at Swan Lake is, is uh, we had to do a, a replacement of a kind of an apron a clover leaf thing on top of our cart barrier. This is an overflow tube that that drains the, the wetland downstream of the lake across the county road. And the water uh, comes up through a 90 degree turn in the culvert and boils over the top of this, this flat structure and the cart can't get up and over it. They come up underneath of it. We got rocks around so there's no plunge pool. But anyway, it's been a very effective uh, cart barrier that Andy Glidden and Joel Clomer came up with a design like this years ago. And this one uh, in this situation works very well. Well, anyway, we had this thing deteriorate and start to break, break down. And here Phil's putting some rocks on it, try to hold it together till we got uh, Cuba welding out there by, by uh, Goose Lake to build us this new cap to it. And this is what it looked like last summer when water levels went down, uh, actually wasn't flowing out anymore put that new cap on it so we're good to go there again. So just, just some time we spent at Goose Lake in, in 2021 to improve things. And keep in mind these projects that we're going through are, or excuse me, not 2020, 2020, are from 2020. Um, you know, we've done a bunch of them in the past, but these are just recent ones I wanna talk about and, and going forward. Uh, there were some repairs done to the lunker structures and uh, the hard points and deflector logs and things like that out at Long Pine SRA by Long Pine. Long Pine Creek is a, is a very popular tubing area on the wreck area as well as fishing area. And the 2019 flood kind of ravaged this area. It didn't completely destroy things, but it damaged them quite a bit. So these are some photos of some reconstruction work that was done out there. And this was a FEMA project. 
and Andy ramrodded, Andy Glidden from Bassett ramrodded this project for us. And uh, it worked out very well. You can see a lunker structure here. Basically you had to peel the bank back, re-rock over the top of those things, put dirt over it, some seed and some fabric. And you can see some rock placed along here and some rock placed along this, this deflector log here. So a lot of work got done out there for about $38,000. And again, uh, FEMA did pay for about 75% of that. Long process dealing with repairs from the 2019 flooding, but it worked out very nicely. So those of you that go out there and, and uh, fish that area or tube that area, you're gonna see some improvements in, in 2021. Ongoing project, again, relating to the 2019 flooding is out at Gracie Creek Pond by Calamus Reservoir on the Northwest end of the reservoir. Very popular little trout pond. It's fed by a cold, the cold water stream, which is Gracie Creek. In 2019, during the flood event, approximately 30,000 cubic yards entered this small two acre pond. So you can tell it did a lot of damage to it and you can see the sediment that washed in in that time period, pretty evident. So this is another FEMA project where, um, you know, they, they did their estimates on it. We did ours and anyway, we've got a project underway, we've got the flat water group hired from Lincoln on that. And they've done some of the mapping on already and some calculations and are getting the plans together and we're identifying spoil sites. We're working with the Bureau of Reclamation out there because they do own the Calamus Reservoir and the Gracie Creek area. So we, we have to work with them. And uh, we're confident that, you know, this project will be, uh, the plans will be finalized. We'll go out for bid sometime this summer and get all the permitting that's necessary to do this. Um, work with the endangered species people on it and uh, hopefully have a project underway by I'd say late summer, early fall, maybe mid fall. Uh, so it's going to happen and we're going to ask for the angler's patience on this because we're going to have to try to drain the lake as best we can probably to get the sediment out. I doubt we can do any hydraulic dredging. One thing you'll notice in the picture in the lower left is the opening in the, in the sheet piling here that goes out the main culvert. We used to have a rotary screen in there that, that um, was disabled and we put in a new rotating screen and it's solar powered and we're gonna see how that works. We've had a few minor complications with that going forward already. But we're going to see how that works. And the reason we want a screen in there is if we don't, if we don't put something in front of that opening, the trout are just going to go out. Once the trout leave that cold water pond and get down in the reservoir, certain times of the year they're not going to survive. Plus, they go from a two-acre pond into a 5,000 acre reservoir and spread out, and you won't catch them anyway. So look for some improvements at the Gracie Creek Pond, probably beginning late summer. Another project we need to complete and get underway is at Summit Lake down by Takama and the towards the extreme southeast part of the district. Summit Lake was, was um, the site of one of our first major rehab projects uh, with the Aquatic Habitat Program. We put in, at that time, $1.1 million to restore Summit Lake in 2000-2001. Tremendously successful project. We put in 13 breakwater jetties, did a lot of digging, a lot of excavating, renovated the lake, the watershed put in some sediment basins on the west and south and as well as sediment basins that filled in over time. It's been quite a while, it's been almost 20 years. So they filled in, so they're, they're basically losing their trapping efficiency. So not only is the sediment getting by the fine sediments, it's also taking the phosphorus with it. We're starting to see some, some uh, um, I guess, decrease in water quality in the summertime in Summit Lake that kind of concerns us a little bit. So anyway, we got Flatwater Group on top of this also, and these are some of their their um, photos here or, or sketches they put together plans. And uh, we're going to do some improvements in, in, in excavation on the west arm of this thing, probably put in a couple of additional cells, try to get maybe up to 20 years worth out of it again. But on the south end, we're going to dig out this area of the lake. It's going to look like this. We need to do some excavating. We're going to hopefully build a couple off channel areas here during high water flows, it'll spill into those, uh, efficiently trap that sediment and those nutrients and, and further protect Summit Lake. Because those of you from that area or fish Summit Lake know that it's been a really good fishing lake over in the past and we want to continue to protect Summit Lake. 
hopefully if we've got the funding we're you know we're going to have to do a drawdown to dig out these sediment basins and if we do a do a drawdown on this thing we'd like to go on the on the west end um, that's filled in since the west sediment basin has been full we're getting sediment down the, the main arm of the lake west of the boat ramp we'd like to see if we can't maybe dig some of that out or push that around anyway um, while we're in there working on the sediment basins i think it'd be a good time to do that if we have to do a drawdown any drawdown we'll we do we'll, we'll try to minimize impacts to the angler on that so I don't think a drawdown would be a bad thing on that lake. Sometimes it's a very good recharge tool to use uh, for fish management purposes. And we have noticed an increase in yellow bass at Summit. They showed up a few years ago and we had one electrofishing station last year where the, where the yellow bass actually outnumbered our largemouth bass. So we're a little bit concerned about that and hopefully they won't expand beyond what they are now. Um, an ongoing project at Willow Creek this spring to fix the jetties will be underway. Uh, this is led by our parks division. And Tony talked about, you know, multiple divisions within the agency and how we all work together. And this is a good example of this. Um, even though it benefits the recreational angler, you know, it is a uh, state recreation area and Parks Division and Jeff Fields took the lead on this. This is another FEMA project to do repairs from the 2019 flooding. It's finally gonna happen again, another FEMA project, another long drawn out kind of process, but you gotta wait for it if you wanna get some money out of them, I guess. And uh, you can see in the, in the set of plans here, the causeway and, and, the, and the bridge on the west end is gonna be rebuilt. It was heavily damaged in the flooding. The breakwaters down in the main lake were, were, were all damaged. They're going to be repaired. The contract has been awarded and work will begin in the spring of 2021 here. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize to the contractor and to let you anglers know that I really don't want work to begin on these, on these breakwaters during the peak of the spring fishing season. And you all know what I mean if you fish Willow Creek. When, when the fish come in shore and hit those breakwaters, um, you certainly don't want an excavator sitting out there hauling rock for, for two weeks while the crappie are biting. So we're going to try to hopefully have them work on the trail and, and the causeway area before they get down on the breakwaters in the main lake. And the other thing that was left out so far of this project is not included in the FEMA project as far as I know, there were three fishing piers, fishing decks, one on the north side, one by the Zimmer Shelter boat ramp, and one in the southeast bay. <clears throat> well, if you've been out there in the past year, you'll notice that there's kind of sort of one there on the north side now, and, the, and the, the two on the south side are gone. So a couple of weeks ago, we were on the ice drilling holes, doing distance and depth profiles to, to uh, figure out if we're going to rebuild these, how are we going to do it, how far are they going to go out, how wide are they going to be, what kind of tee they're going to have on them that kind of stuff. So we're in the planning process for that. And I'd really like to see these things uh, get rebuilt, probably be a combination of park funds and some of our angler access money, but look for some work to be done at Willow Creek this spring. And uh, hopefully we're not gonna impact your or my fishing up there this spring. Another projects that have been completed that, that uh, again, the other divisions have, have essentially taken the lead on been some new boat ramp construction. One of them is at Lewis and Clark Lake and the Wygon Marina, which is on the lower left photo. Uh, the north boat ramp there in the marina basin needed to be extended. So it was, it was a pour and push was done up there last fall to extend that out because boats were, with the big boats and trailers we have now, are going dropping off the end of the concrete. And obviously, you know, that can do some serious damage and we don't want that to happen to people. So there was an, uh, a new ramp was poured there. It, it basically, it's, it's the pour and push. It's poured upon the bank and pushed in. And you can see it goes out quite a ways. Um, so we're not gonna have to worry about that. You know, people backing off the end of that again anymore. Uh, and there's also some stops on the end of it. So you'll know it when you hit it, but I guarantee you're not gonna hit it anymore. But to get the docks back in, and this project's going to be done, ready to go by this spring. Another one is the new boat ramp at Ponkett State Park. 
one down by the river. It was heavily damaged in high water events past several years. And there was a new ramp poured in there, took a lot of concrete. There's actually six dozers here lined up to push in that slab of concrete that became the boat ramp here. So pretty impressive project. Again, Parks Division took the lead on those. Um, and the Ponca one, I believe, was a FEMA project. Uh, so look for those improvements this year. We've got some new docks at Willow Creek Reservoir that went in last year. There were some minor issues with some of them that we're working to resolve. Some of the metal sticking out, we don't want scratching boats. So we're gonna work on that. The anchor system on some of those needs to be improved. We're gonna work on that with Parks Division to make it more user-friendly. But I'm, I'm just really tickled we've got new docks up there at Willow Creek. Also, wildlife guys informed me that there's a new restroom at the Verdell Landing WMA uh, up on the Missouri River by Verdell. It's been sorely needed. Glad to see that. So those of you that fish up on the river have probably noticed that already. If, if you haven't been up there lately, you'll see a new restroom. And the other thing I want to mention is Peterson Lake in, in Rock County, which is south of Bassett. And Peterson Lake was part of our OFW program, open uh, fish and water program, or fields and water. Um, it's, it's just basically south of the Twin Lakes WMA north and south twin out there. Uh, it was a private lake. It's now in Game and Parks ownership through a, a land trade with the landowner that had purchased that lake. And uh, we're pretty tickled to have Peterson Lake. It's, it's a good fishery, you know, largemouth bass, bluegill, uh, northern pike, uh, yellow perch. It's been a good lake. They had some good catches through the ice out there this year. Uh, so we're gonna be able to, to guarantee we're gonna have access to that lake uh, for years and years to come because we now own about 80% of it. Uh, we're working on better boat access up there. We've got to work on, uh, I'll work with the adjacent landowner for an access road to get to a boat launch area. And we're probably going to put an, in an articulated concrete mat boat ramp there, similar to what we did at Swan Lake eventually. So we're going to make it a little better for, um, for access for our anglers, but we're excited to have that. I should mention that in the high water the last few years, we have gotten carp in Peterson Lake, but they, they uh, are there in small numbers and have not impacted the fishery yet. So we'll be keeping an eye on that and hope people can get out there to fish, fish it. Just be another nice lake to fish if you're out there at Twin Lakes. I'm gonna go over and talk about some, some uh, actual fish projects we've been doing. Um, hey Jeff, these, Jeff. Yes. this is Tony Barretta and I just wanted to, uh, um, chime in here. This is a good spot here just to encourage folks to uh, um, use that chat box to um, ask questions as things come up as Jeff's talking about specific projects. Shoot that question over into the chat box. That way we can address those um, later. So just as Jeff's going through the project, there hasn't been a lot of chatter yet on the on questions. Uh, feel feel free. Um, we encourage we encourage the the discussion and this conversation. Um, so so chime in when when you can. Okay, thanks, Tony. Yeah, we we encourage feedback or questions. If you got something, and towards the end, even if it doesn't relate to something we've talked about, just I know a lot of you are going to have questions about what's going on in the district. But I wanted to mention some fish marking that we did in in 2020. We do a technique of marking with, with a chemical called oxytetracycline or OTC. And we batch mark fish when they're fry, like three or four days out, you know, post hatch. And you can mark them by the millions in tanks. And we, we do marking at North Platte and Calamus Hatchery. And here you can see the, some of the tanks from some past marking at the Calamus. And these, these tanks here contain millions of three to four day old walleye that we're, we're marking. Basically, we mix chemical in the water and it leaves a mark on the bony structure. Well, last year, we marked a lot of fry across the state to, you know, once and for all, determine whether we've got any natural reproduction going on in some of our walleye lakes. And we went out in the fall, Phil and I went out and collected some young of the year walleye at Calamus and Davis Creek, about 100 from each lake. Unfortunately, you know, we need, we need to kill them, but it's not going to hurt the population because what we do is we pull the otolith or the bony, bony structure uh, out of the head, which sets by the brain on these fish. And we pull the small otolith out 
<clears throat> mount those on the slide and sand them down when you put them under a special light filtered scope you get if they're marked you get this nice little gold ring that shows up and uh, it's a great marking tool for us but so we looked at these fish from Calamus Davis Creek, found out 96% of the young of the year we collected the Calamus were stocked fish, 94% Davis Creek were stocked fish. So it kind of puts to rest once and for all, you know, the, the question of the need for stocking at these lakes and if there's any natural reproduction. So basically there's, there's little or no natural reproduction out there and certainly not near enough to, to uh, keep those walleye populations going. So in, in essence, they are stock populations out there. Another project that's been ongoing that we did again in, in 2020 was we marked, marked fingerling walleye going into Lewis Clark Lake. Had some problems with uh, the fish populations up in Lewis and Clark following 2011, so it go, goes back a while. We've been marking walleye up there, and uh, this year we found overall from the lake and the delta, 20% of the young year walleye we collected were marked fish. Not quite as high as we've seen in the past. We've seen as high as, as 90 plus percent in the past and, and one year 60%. Uh, but there was one other year that we had just 20%. So a lot of factors go into Lewis and Clark Lake and that river system. Most of it deals with flow, which is nothing we can control. During high water years, we're gonna lose some fish. Uh, you know, during, during low water years, low flow years, we're gonna keep fish in the reservoir. And, uh, you know, 12% this year of the, of the young of the year collected below Gallon Point Dam were marked, which is a lot lower than other years. So most fish are going right through the system. They go right through the dam. It doesn't, doesn't impede them whatsoever. And the, the neat thing about it was that this year, we not only kept the young of the year fish, we kept age one and, and older walleye, the adult walleye, because just to know that the, that the young fish are out there, the young of the year doesn't really mean anything unless they recruit to the fishery, which is age one, two, and beyond. Well, what we found out this year that in South Dakota, I should get, give them credit for looking at these marks um, on, these, on these old lists, but 20% of the age one walleye were marked and 17% of the age two. So that's great information to have, knowing that these fish are contributing a couple of years down the road to the fishery. And those age two fish are gonna end up in the angler's bucket uh, this year. So. Hopefully, you know, we can make a dent to try to get those numbers up a little bit. In years where we have low numbers of walleye, that 20% might not mean so much, but years where you, you know, you got, where you got low numbers of walleye, it means a lot. High numbers of walleye may not mean as much, but that helps us make that decision on whether to stock or whether or not to stock. You see whether it's making a difference for the angler. Another project that's coming up on Lewis and Clark that's gonna be really cool. And Dr. Mark Pegg, who's, who's listening in, is gonna be the lead researcher on this. But South Dakota took the lead and sponsored a, uh, a, a movement study on walleye from Fort Randall Dam to down below Gavins Point Dam. There's some changes going on in that system up there, particularly with Lewis and Clark Lake and our walleye numbers. But as everybody knows that fish is up there in the Delta and the river and the Verdell area and on up below Randall, there's a lot of walleye in that system and a lot of sauger. So we're gonna find out where these fish are hanging out, where they're coming from, hopefully, you know, where they spend their life seasonally and see if we can, can fine tune some areas that need to be protected, come up with some better management objectives and just understand a little bit better about what's going on. This project has been a long time in the making and like I said, South Dakota took the lead on it. They, they bought these, these radio tags for walleye. Nebraska is piggybacked on top of this. We bought the, the tags for the sauger. And uh, very pleased to work with, with Dr. Pegg on this and, and uh, a PhD student uh, to get these fish marked and, and find out what's going on. There's gonna be listening stations in these four different zones uh, in, in this reach of river and the tagging will begin this spring, probably shortly after ice out. So uh, it's gonna be a multi-year study, so stay tuned. We'll probably have some updates on that as we go from year to year. But we're really excited about this to learn more about that system up there. Got some renovation projects coming up. Uh, a couple of them are gonna happen at Fremont Lakes, unless we get a, a huge ice jam down by Fremont. Uh, in the next couple of days, and it seems like uh, it, it's kind of waning down there. 
that might screw up Lake 20 or Lake 16, we're going to renovate those two lakes this summer. And this is a result of the flooding we had in 2019 also. A lot of the lakes at Fremont rec area got flooded, a lot of sand pits. And you can see Phil holding the big buffalo on the right hand side over there. Uh, a lot of rough fish got in. Lake 20 was a really good fishery uh, when we renovated it the first time a number of years back. <clears throat> and Lake 16 got full of rough fish. And these are not white bass, these are white perch. So what the flood did too, it distributed white perch throughout the system and some of those contaminated lakes and we need to kill them start over. Some of you might cringe because we're talking about hitting Goose Lake, but everybody knows Goose Lake's full of carp and we've got a problem. They got in there in 2010, so it's been a building problem. The high water the last few years has really saved us as far as the carp not destroying the water quality as bad as they could have. But we've seen our pike population crash from about 90 per net in the spring to like one or two now. Um, so the handwriting is on the wall. The bright spot is the bass population out there. And that's why some of you might cringe. Uh, there's some, some really good bass fishing in the last couple of years. Um, and, and obviously we'll impact that, but we're, we're probably the only ones hoping for a dry year because we need a dry year at Goose Lake to get that thing renovated. We need to get that lake back online, get our perch back, get our bluegill back, get our pike back, and, and then we'll have bass again also. But it really was a go-to destination in this part of Nebraska, in, in, in eastern Nebraska for northern pike. And we can have that fishery again, and we need to get it restored. But I don't know if that renovation is gonna happen because mother nature needs to help us out and we're gonna to have to see how things go. Uh, had some snow this winter, but it's been really dry in that country going through the fall. Uh, so there's not a lot of water standing around and, and the lake levels out there dropped four to five feet last fall. So we're gonna, we're gonna see how things go. And we, we do plan a salvage effort on these lakes prior to renovation and uh, take what good fish we can find out of there and, and put them in a lake that'll be accessible to the angler. Another project that I'm pretty excited about coming up this, this summer will be the, the swap out of some fish cleaning units. Currently, those of you that use our fish cleaning units know that they're for the most part grinder units. They're like a big garbage disposal. Some fish species they don't take very well like catfish and, and uh, even white bass are pretty hard on them and these grinders break down and then we lose that fish cleaning station so we can get some new parts ordered and parks guys can get them swapped out. Um, the Barracuda unit is, is a new type of a roller, roller grinder type, type of a fish cleaning station. State of South Dakota has swapped out virtually all of their grinders to this unit. Um, we have two of these units, the Corps of Engineers purchased and retrofitted at Harlan County. They, they work very well. They're maintenance free. The anglers love them. We have one at Davis Creek that the NRD purchased. We have one at Cramper Lake by Hubbard that the NRD purchased. <clears throat> so we have already have two of these in our district and we're excited to put two of these at the Calamus this year, this summer. It might be late, late spring, you know, early summer, mid summer by the time we get them swapped out. But you anglers are gonna absolutely love these fish cleaning machines. Uh, eventually, we're going to see about getting one up at Lewis and Clark and, and in, around the state. This is the way to go for fish cleaning units, and we're excited to have them. So look for that improvement at Calamus Reservoir this summer. <clears throat> now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about some fish stocking, which a lot of people are interested in. We stock a lot of fish in this district. We stock a lot of fish in this state, and that's why our hatcheries are so important. Our grand total, and this is for our request for this district in 2021, is over 11 million fish. Now, granted, you look down here on the screen a little bit farther, 9.9 .9 million of those are walleye fry. We're big into stocking walleye fry. But there's a lot of fish requested of other species also. Stocking is very important to keep some of these reservoirs going, these fish populations going. Most of our lakes are flood control lakes. Once you stock your bass, your bluegill, your crappie, things like that, they take care of themselves. Channel catfish need to be stocked on an annual or every other year basis. Wipers need to be stocked every year. You know, um, walleye need to be stocked every year. 
Um, and, and you know, there's various reasons for some of these different stockings, but they're important to us. But I just, the, the picture on the right shows what we've come up with in Nebraska here for stocking fry and fingerling fish. We can actually flush the fish off the hatchery trucks into tanks on our boats, go out in the lake, open a valve, distribute those fish throughout the lake without having to put a net to them. And this really, really decreases the mortality on these stocked fish. So when they come out, the only time they see a net anymore, a lot of them is when they come out of the catch basin uh, at, at say Calamus Hatchery and are loaded on a truck then they're flushed off the truck and flushed off the boat in the lake. It's a pretty ingenious way to stock fish. Very good on the fish. Uh, we have very little mortality and that just gives us better st stocking survival right off the bat. A couple stockings that I want to mention that we're doing a little different. If anybody watched last night's Southeast District presentation, they talked a lot about stocking advanced walleye and sawgye. They're, they, they mainly have flood control reservoirs down there. And sometimes we have a hard time with fingerling and fry stockings, uh, getting the return that we, we desire in those types of reservoirs. So we've switched out to some uh, advanced walleye, we call them, they're eight to nine inch fish. Told the hatcheries what we wanted, they come, came up with a solution to it, they can grow them, they, they finish them on minnows and uh, grow some really tremendous fish by the end of the year and they go in and not only can they avoid predation from largemouth bass and other fish or, or crappie that might be in the lake, they, they're all ready to turn the tide and start feeding on some panfish. So we've been using these at Skyview for the past three or four years and seeing a really good return on the walleye there. And uh, so we're gonna now try them at Maple Creek, Cramper and Summit. So we're gonna have four lakes, we're gonna try them. We have tried these in the past at, at uh, Buckskin Hills and Powder Creek and didn't have the returns that we thought we were gonna have on that. Actually our fingerling stockings up there were doing just as good. So as a result of our sampling, we scrapped those lakes and we're gonna, we're gonna go with, uh, with these four now. The other thing we do for walleye uh, stocking in this district is we do a concurrent walleye fry and fingerling stockings at Calmus and Davis Creek. Kind of doing that at Willow Creek too with, with walleye and saw guy, and I'll get to that. But we stock walleye fry as three to five day old fry. And then we come back in June and stock one and a half to two inch fingerlings. And uh, we've been pretty successful with keeping our population levels up. Calamus and Davis Creek get fish so hard. They're so important to our fishing here in this district and to the state that we simply can't afford to have missing or weak year classes. So this is what we're, we're doing to keep that recruitment level up. And what we found through some OTC marking at Calamus was some years the walleye fry have better survival. Sometimes the walleye fingerling do better. Well, if we do the double stocking, you know, we can try to try to fool mother nature and, and keep that recruitment up. Um, I think it's a really good way to go. Hopefully we can continue that in the future. It takes a few more eggs when we go out for walleye spawn egg collection and a little bit more work by the hatchery guys, but I think it's been very successful with those reservoirs. We're also uh, switching <laughs> over to some saw guy in this district. Saw guy have been doing very good at Willow Creek Reservoir. Uh, the fingerling stocking has, we'll continue to stock walleye fry Tall guy fingerling, try to make something happen at Willow Creek. It's on the uptick right now. So um, looks like 2021 will be a pretty good year up there. And we're gonna go uh, with saw guy and walleye on an every year basis at, at Willow Lake. Be walleye one year, saw guy another. Willow Lake in Brown County, we renovated several years ago. Unfortunately, didn't get a complete kill. We got cart back in there. And walleye were stocked back in there a few years after it was restocked and they've really taken off. But they've kind of plateaued and taken a step backwards because of probably because of angling pressure and plus things have just stabilized. We had a rise in the population now it, it, it always tends to flatten out. Based on the results from saw guy and other lakes around the state and in this district we think it's a pretty good fit for some of our reservoirs particularly those that maybe don't have the best water quality and other states in the midwest are using saw guy and we're going to try them too and we think it's going to be a good thing. I also want to mention our trout stocking coming up. We're going to have news releases coming out on that pretty quick. 
that's the big kickoff to spring. It's going to be in about two weeks. You can see some of the lakes listed there that we that we stock trout, catchable 10 to 12 inch trout. Um, and, and counting on Grove, you can always figure on a few bigger ones in there, but been very popular with our anglers, both spring and fall. And uh, we'll probably won't pick actual hard dates for some of these lakes, but more the week of when the guys get a chance to haul them. But for Tazuka, Pawnee Park West and Columbus and um, West Point Pond, we usually pick a hard date on a Saturday because we always get fantastic turnout at those lakes. A lot of anglers show up to meet the truck and, and to start catching trout. So look forward to that. It's coming soon. All right, I'm, I'm rambling on quite, quite a bit here. I'll try to speed things up a little bit and go through some of the uh, fishing forecasts. You can find this on our website and uh, I'll go briefly through it and highlight some of our lakes, but we use a variety of methods to collect the data and the fish that goes into these fishing forecasts and these graphs. We use frame nets that are used for panfish species that are set along the shorelines where the fish swim into them. And uh, we, we come along and pull those nets. So if you see something like this out on the lake, please don't take it, please don't pull it in the shore. We've got those set out overnight so we can come back next day and see what we got for fish. We use gill nets for open water fish, walleye, wipers, white bass, catfish. Very effective, kind of hard on the fish, but, but that's one tool that we have to use. We do a ton of electrofishing. Um, we do a lot of that work at night. This is our new electrofishing boat uh, with our mood lights on it, our little blue lights so we can see on the bottom of the boat. And we turn into night owls in the spring of the year, particularly sampling largemouth bass. So you can see Phil here working up a, a tub full of northern pike back at Goose, in the heydays of Goose Lake when we had tons of pike. So a lot of effort goes into it. I won't tell you to take these with a grain of salt, but there are a lot of compounding factors that affect our samples that we can't control. You know, weather, wind, cold fronts, excessive vegetation, excessive algae around the nets. We try to do the best we can. We try to standardize same water temperature, same time of the year per gear, same locations on lakes, things like that, but it can be difficult. And I'm going to use this example of, of Swan Lake as an example that timing is everything. Last year in the spring of 2020, we went out to Swan Lake multiple times to try to get an idea when the best time was to go catch yellow perch in our frame nets. Because if we're passing this information along to the angler and we're using this information and lake frequency data and aging growth data, to manage these fish populations and make management decisions, we need the best data we can get. So this is just a prime example. If you go too early or too late, look at look at what we miss, you know, as far as data collections and inferences uh, on our catch rates, not our catch rates, but our size structure. So what we've learned from multiple samples is we need to get out there probably between about the first and maybe the 10th of, of April to get what we think is a more representative perch sample because we completely miss these larger yellow perch in these other time frames. So there's a temporal distribution of these fish and we have to try to hit that. Now with three people in a big district, it's hard to get that timing right every year, but if we think we've got a problem with some lakes and really need some good information, we'll target that and come up with that. But we learned a lot just running multiple sets uh, on, on one different lake. It takes a lot of effort, but, but you know, we learned that at Swan Lake, we've got some nice perch. We heard from anglers they were catching nice perch. We'd see a few with electrofishing gear, had a hard time catching them in frame nets. Now we know why, we were missing them. Our timing was off. So there can be timing off on a lot of these catches. So let's, let's get to the, some of the graphs. Here's the walleye graph statewide. The, the blue arrows are highlighting some lakes in our district. We've got some good walleye fishing in this state, folks. And, um, you know, some of them are on the western, the, the, the middle part of the state, the, the western part of the state or southwest part of the state. But we've got a couple good ones here in this district. And the top two are going to be Davis Creek and Calamus, two of our irrigation reservoirs. Good walleye catch in 2020, good size structure. we got good recruitment. We're slicing them through. Growth rates are good on them. Uh, anglers are, are doing well out there. We've got good fishing going on. Here's Willow Lake out in Brown County, south of Ainsworth. 
doing good size structure, harvestable fish. And uh, here's Willow Creek. Like I say, that's on the uptake. It's getting better, should be a good year. Lewis and Clark Lake is down here about six or seven per net. We're disappointed in that, but that's about where it's been lately. So to zero in on a couple of these lakes, here's Calamus, just a closer look at Calamus for you folks. Here's, here's 20 years worth of data basically on what's been going on at the Calamus. This is our gillnet catch in the fall for walleye based on different size groups. Beginning in about 2010, we started some different regulations out there. We started a different stocking strategy out there and we've got pretty good recruitment going on. And to break that down a little farther and fish above and below 18 inches, which is where our size limits are. Remember in, at Calamus, we've got kind of segmented harvest going on. We got two fish between 15 and 18 and two fish over 18. It's kind of a hybrid rule from what we used to call the old Copeland rule that's, that allowed one under 18 and the rest had to be over 18. Well, we're, we're, what we're, we're trying to accomplish out there is to segment that harvest so you get two and two. So we can allow some pretty, you know, allow some harvest to the smaller fish, limited harvest to the bigger fish and hopefully have a mix of both of them. And it seems to be working pretty good. We've got fish over 18 inches out there and abundant fish in that 15 to 18 inch range. So it seems to be doing what we want to do. And this is kind of the telling graph. This is just strictly the harvestable walleye at Calamus Reservoir since we started instituting some changes. And a couple of years here, it was down. You know, I was telling you about timing is everything. We, we had cold fronts come through, kind of screwed up our sample for, for a couple of years. And I fully, anticipated that these bars should have been higher. But anyway, even if they're not, if you look at the means on the catch of harvestable sized fish, we have close to three times more harvestable walleye at Calamus now than we did prior to making some of these management changes. So I think that bodes well for the angler because most anglers I know like to eat walleye. Here at Davis Creek, what happened there over the years, this is where we started aggressively stocking when the Southwest District guys had that in their district for a while and really made something happen at Davis Creek. We saw a dip in here. This is due to a shad die off. This is gonna show you the importance of, of uh, the prey base in these lakes. And, but it's rebounding very nicely. It's gonna be a good year in 2021. It was a good year last year. Here's what Lewis and Clark looks like. Pretty anemic since 2011. Got some things going on there we need to figure out. But fish are in the system. They're just farther up, up, the, up the river uh, all the way to Fort Randall. And here's Willow Creek. We're seeing an uptick, uptick there also, but look at the amount of saw guy that's making up our catch in our samples. 100% in 2019, 79% in 2020. White bass across the state. Again, some good lakes. We also uh, have two good lakes in this district. Unfortunately, they're a little ways away from, from this part of the district, but Calamus and Davis Creek. And uh, should be another really good year at, at, at Calamus. Anytime we get over 10 per net, we're doing really well out there. And if I had to guess, I'd say we probably, probably harvested at least 40,000 white bass out of Calamus last year. And Davis Creek hit and miss with our gill nets. Uh, our low catch out there doesn't really reflect how many fish we have because we see them in the angler's bag out there and they catch them at the inlet in the spring. Wipers are kind of the same way as white bass. Calamus and Davis Creek are two main lakes here, even though we stock some at Willow Creek. Um, you gotta go west to catch wipers. And we've got some good wiper fisheries in the state, but if you wanna catch them, you gotta travel ways to, to find them. But um, Calamus, we thought we were really getting into some good ones here. We had a great size structure, these fish over 20 inches. We had some disease problems. We had some bacterial infections wipe out some of those fish and it kind of knocked us back a little bit, but hopefully we'll get that to grow again. And here's our, our Davis Creek over time. You can see they're, they're kind of up and down, but they are out there and they're available for people to catch. We've got great channel catfishing in the district. Pick a flood control reservoir, you're gonna catch catfish. I see a ton of them caught right here at Skyview Lake in Norfolk. There's Davis Creek's catch, Willow Creek and how they relate statewide. A lot of the good catfish lakes are the ones sampled down in southeast Nebraska. Um, you know, those flood control reservoirs are just, are just great places to grow channel catfish. 
Calamus, even though our catch is, is, is showing decreasing trend in our gillnets, the tournament fishermen love that lake because of the big catfish out there. We were stocking some five inch catfish in these years, we've now gone back to our 10 inch catfish stockings to try to boost our recruitment out there. But I can tell you this, our, our, our gill net sites and the time of the year that we do it are not conducive for a real good catfish catch, but pretty good fishing out there. And here's Willow Creek, our catfish numbers are a little bit depressed. We continue to stock it. Folks, we got some water quality problems up there. I think everybody's aware of that are, that are hurting us right now. Got some great bass lakes. Here's how they stack up across the state. And you can find all these graphs and charts online too on that fishing forecast and pick out the lakes. But we've got some good fishing here. And these are just the lakes in the Northeast that we sampled last year. You're gonna find good success in our flood control reservoirs. You're also gonna find good success in some of these, in some of the sand hills lakes towards the, end, the bottom of the graph. Uh, don't, don't be fooled by these catch rates less than hundred on a sand hill lake, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, I'll take that any day on a Sand Hill Lake. And we grow some tremendous bass in our Sand Hill Lakes. Here's our AIS tech, Caitlin from last year, holding a seven pound largemouth bass. We also grow from tremendous bluegill in this part of the state. And you can check out some of the catch rates here. Most people look for the green bars to see where the bigger bluegill are. And we've got some good lakes. Um, Cramper Lake's gonna be one of them that we didn't sample last year. The new one up by Hubbard's a good one, but but places like Grove, Maskentine, Summit, uh, and Cramper, they're, they're good bluegill lakes. You can't go wrong by going to those lakes. We're having a little bit of an issue down at Maple Creek with our bluegill. So the new one down by Lee, or fairly new one, we're, we're seeing some water quality problems down there following the 2019 flooding. We're hopeful that it will come back. There are some nice fish there. We just didn't see the numbers last year that we anticipated, but we've got some good bluegill fishing going on. None of our crappie data through kind of a mix up made, made the statewide graph, but you can take a look at this. We've got some good fisheries in the state. Closest one to our district is probably Sherman. It's just kind of a crappie factory as, as, as is Merritt. But uh, Whitney out west is gonna be tremendous this year. But with that said, we did sample crappie this spring along with bluegill in some of our lakes. And here's Phil with two really nice crappie at Summit Lake that we took last spring in our nets. So our picks are gonna be Cramper, Willow Creek, Grove, Summit, and Maple Creek for, for crappie fishing. I don't think you can go wrong by going to one of those lakes. The only lake that's probably not impacted by some vegetation is gonna be Cramper and Willow Creek. I, I'm looking for a pretty good year at Willow Creek on crappie and walleye both this year up there and, and saw guy. Let's talk about paddlefish for just a second. Kirk Stephenson from the Missouri River uh, program. He's the coordinator there, a program manager, uh, providing me this information. We have an archery season and a snagging season for paddlefish. They're both extremely popular, as judged by the drawing odds of 44.8%. So you pretty much got to have a preference point to draw a permit. But we issue 275 and South Dakota issues 275. Um, there is a fee for those permits. And don't forget, the application period is the month of March, the, the first two weeks in March. A lot of people miss that every year and forget about that. 2016, the season was changed from first, first weekend in July for 30 days to the month of June. And it really improved the success uh, for our true paddlefish. We were hoping to get people to go down the river because the month of June has historically been a good month down the river to shoot paddlefish. <clears throat> a lot of them go in the tailwaters anyway, and, and they've collected, you know, quite a few fish and a good, good size structure on them. Kirk gets a little bit nervous, as does Jason Sorensen in South Dakota, when we see this number of slot fish taking that, taking that the, the that the snaggers have to have to turn loose, but I think that's a function of what's out there in the population. Snag season is the month of October. 1600 permits issued by each state. You got to have a preference point to be guaranteed to draw a permit there. But usually every year there's a few people that draw without a preference point. See, typically they harvest close to 800 fish a year. Um, 2019, 2018 were, were down years. We had high water, gates were open. 2020, the gates opened halfway through the season, which kind of screwed things up. 
but they did take some nice fish. So uh, it, it was a better season in the last two years, but you had to be there. Probably the better snagging, I, I think, was the first two weeks of the season. But they are taking some fish over the slot. They had a good year on bigger fish last year. And the seasons and application periods, and I should mention application period for snagging season is, is the first two weeks in July. So don't forget about that. Mark that on the calendar. Same permits, same season, same closed areas. Everything's the same for 2021. And Kirk provided this graph showing the, the 2021 Missouri River forecast for runoff. And it looks like a moderate to low water year. So right away, I'm thinking, great, the gates are going to be closed. Snagging's going to be good this year. Not so fast. Corps of Engineers is going to do some more work on the generators and turbines at the power plant. So beginning October 19th, the gates are going to be open 24 hours a day. So I would suggest if you draw a snagging permit, want to get up there before the gates are open, get up there prior to October 19th. There'll, and there'll be news releases out on that come fall. Okay, last thing I want to talk about is aquatic invasive species. We're kind of ground central for AIS in this district. And uh, we're, we're dealing with it as best we can. And we ask help from the anglers and recreational boaters not to spread these species around. Please clean, drain, and dry. We're going to have inspectors out again this year doing inspections, talking to boaters trying to educate them and also, you know, making sure that they don't have water in their boat prior to launch, ask them where they came from, from their last trip, make sure they don't have water in the boat when they leave, make sure everything's dry. Please don't move these fish around like the Asian carp. Right now, they are not above Gavin's Point Dam that we know of, and there's only one way they can get there. And that's somebody with a bucket. So, we want to keep them where they are. And please don't move crayfish around because there's a ton of rusty crayfish up below Gavin's. They're an invasive species also. We've got red swamp crayfish that people brought in as a bait and let them go. So we've got problems with, with crayfish up there below the dam and in Lake Yankton. Please don't move crayfish around. <clears throat> if you see something like this hanging off a boat dock, that's one of our adult zebra mussel samplers. Please leave it there. We have a problem with people stealing those. We check those frequently throughout the year. It's one of the ways we check, you know, look for zebra mussels. And keep your fingers crossed, we don't see something like this in some of our lakes because this is one that was hanging off a dock in Lewis and Clark. So that'll show you how quickly they'll colonize things. But there, there are a very effective way to sample. So we also uh, sample for uh, villagers in our lakes. And we do a lot of lakes across the state and across the district and send samples in looking for villagers, which is the, the microscopic young of these critters, and, and we're hoping um, that we can keep them at bay. They're in the Missouri River, all the way up the system, I think, up to Lake Sharp now. So it's very important if you're fishing the River Lewis and Clark Lake, make sure everything's drained when you come off of there. Particularly, don't go to another lake with water in your boat, because you probably have villagers in your live well and in your boat if you've got lake water in there or river water in there. I guarantee you'll have villagers in there. Some things we're doing with the Asian carp this year is some eDNA sampling uh, on Lewis and Clark Lake, uh, Missouri River, and, and some rivers statewide. Um, Dr. Pegg is taking charge of that, taking the lead on that, I should say. Um, it's a way to filter some water and find out if you can detect DNA from Asian carp. It's kind of a good way to put it. We're also going to be looking at with Missouri River Cruise population dynamic studies, Missouri River, Low Gallons Point Dam and tributaries, population dynamics of Asian carp. And we're also going to look at the, the community structure of fish with and without Asian carp, which basically is below Gavins and below Randall because down below Rand, below Gavins, we know they're, they're thick as fleas. But they're gonna look at the differences in fish community structure between those two systems, one with Asian carp and one without, try to gain some insight into that. So with that, I've rambled on quite, quite a lengthy time here. Hopefully we conveyed a lot of information to you folks and uh, we haven't bored you too much with our talk. So at this point, 
I'm going to turn it back over to Tony or or uh, Jordan, and uh, if there's any questions that came in, we can answer them. Hopefully, there's some questions. You bet. Good job, Jeff. A lot of a lot of great information, and and we did have uh, um, some questions start start rolling in. Um, some fairly specific to some of the things you were talking about, and and also uh, some general questions that can be answered by uh, a number of our other folks um, that are on the call. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll have Jordan Cott, who's going to moderate the question and answer uh, session here, chime in. All right. Uh, Tony, I'm going to give this first one to you. So it, um, it's talking about how we keep getting undesirable fish species in many of our uh, uh, lakes and reservoirs and how most of that is uh, occurring through use of live bait. Has there been any discussion about making it illegal to sain your own bait or um, increasing the uh, regulate the number of uh, lakes that have the regulation uh, where you cannot use live bait at uh, specific water bodies? Yeah, we have, uh, we, we continue to look at our, our distribution of, of different aquatic invasive species. Uh, and as, as especially Asian carp have, have migrated and, and, and become further distrib distributed within our in interior rivers, um, I can't remember what the year was, but we, we did implement a, uh, a section of of um, of our state, and it's mainly the eastern side where where you can't you, you basically you can't collect um, uh, bait and move it away from that water body, that stream, um, um, and use it in a different water body. And we've had a lot of internal discussions. Had a committee actually come together and look at um, the potential changes that are needed because of aquatic invasive species um, to. Uh, to limit some of our um, bait fish collections and movement. And we're continuing to look at that. We have had discussions, you know, all, well, um, it hasn't been brought to uh, the commission yet, but there have been discussions about moving that line further west um, to where um, we wouldn't allow uh, movement of, of any sane bait fish uh, to leave, leave that stream. So. So yeah, there's discussions. It's a it's a major threat to a lot of our lakes and reservoirs, as Jeff was stating, and uh, one of those things that um, we can't stress enough: don't move water and don't move fish. Okay. Uh, we have another one here, um, Tony. I'm going to address this one to you. This kind of a general question about why. Why does it seem like in Nebraska we have uh, limited to no natural reproduction of, of fish in general? And uh, I, I reached out to Dave on uh, on the message or on the uh, chat function to see if he had specific species in general. But maybe you could just start talking about some of our main uh, main species, such as you know uh, walleye in particular. That seems to be the the question we get quite a bit within our agency anyway. Yeah, the, the walleye, like you, like, like uh, Jeff was talking about, it's something that we uh, stock a lot of and, and we've shown over time that um, through, through different evaluations that um, we have, uh, depending on the lake or reservoir setting, we have very little natural recruitment. And that just comes down to the, uh, the, the overall habitat in the reservoir. Um, um, sometimes it's it, it's one of those things from from the uh, the siltation that comes into our reservoirs or lakes. Other times it can be what what we have for uh, different cobble substrate or potential spawning areas. And then there's a lot of other different things that um, impact whether a fish spawns and then actually those fish recruit into the population, which are uh, competition with other fish species. So. There's a lot of different things that um, are interacting that really kind of uh, suppress our walleye recruitment. Um, 
um, reproduction and recruitment in our in our water bodies. That said, we do have some water bodies that, that we have natural recruitment and that we've shown um, at times where we have uh, have skip had to skip stocking um, on certain reservoirs that we've pulled off decent year classes at certain reservoirs. So um, it's not everywhere, but uh, a lot of it comes down to uh, the habitat available within a water body and then uh, potentially the other uh, circumstances, whether it's um, biology or biotic or abiotic, you know, chemistry, water chemistry and, and flow and that sort of thing. So, and we got a lot of other um, biologists on the call here and other, other guys that have, have a lot of expertise in this sort of thing. So feel free to uh, um, provide some answers as well as you, as you guys see fit too. Anybody else care to jump in on that? All right. Uh, Jeff and Phil, let's um, move on to you guys. Here's one. Um, this is regarding Lewis and Clark and the walleye. So are the lower numbers of marked walleye fry in Lewis and Clark due to losing those fry through the dam? Or can this be interpreted as an indicator of higher natural reproduction or recruitment in uh, Lewis and Clark? It's a good observation. This year, we saw higher numbers of naturally recruited fish. We've, in the past, we've always had good numbers of, of natural reproduction and recruitment in Lewis and Clark Lake. And that's why it kind of shocked me to see when we started stocking these marked fish that they certain years contribute pretty heavily. Um, that's not always been the case up there. And I never thought I'd see the day where Lewis and Clark might might have to be a stocked lake. I, I think we have an, we may have enough natural reproduction to get going. But yes, during high water years, we're, we're losing fish also. We know that I didn't I, I talked way more than I should have tonight, but um, I didn't put up some of the graphs we have that, that show the relationship between flow in Lewis and Clark Lake and walleye numbers. And it's pretty striking and it's a good fit on that data. Uh, and that's something something that's, that we really can't do anything about. But uh, yeah, there's some years we get really good natural reproduction, some years not so good. Sauger last couple of years has been outstanding and outstanding. Whatever they like, conditions were good for them last couple of years. You might want to mention the web reports. Now. Oh yeah, you can you can look at this on the web reports. Uh, Phil put together a Lewis and Clark Lake report. It's on our website, and uh, you can see some of the charts and graphs and explanation on that. A little bit better probably when I can can I can uh, explain right now. But go ahead and read that report. I just put the link up in the uh, oops. in the uh, chat to our uh, fishing forecast page. Um, Jeff and Phil, here's another one. Are any cutthroat uh, trout scheduled to be stocked in Verdigree uh, Creek? Yes. Yes, we're, 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 we're putting, if we have any extras, we're putting them in the creek, but we're going to put put some in Hidden Lake, which is um, up the drainage and over the hill. Uh, if you need to know where Hidden Lake is, give us a call here at the office, but that's part of the, 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 the trout slam. So we're putting cut throats in there. And uh, like I said, we do have a standing request if we have any extras to put them in the stream itself. So they'll be, they'll be up there probably in Hidden Lake. And uh, one more uh, regarding cutthroats on the verdigree. Any um, thought to putting a catch and release reg for on cutthroats on the verdigree system? Uh, not at this time because we haven't been stocking them. It's such a heavily fished stream uh, above Grove Lake that we put, we stock 200 catchable rainbows a week up there now. 
and it gets a lot of fishing pressure. And I guess we're probably geared more towards harvest at this point than we are on catch and release. Um, you know, depends on, I guess, in the future, if we get enough people that want cutthroats up there and if they can tell them apart, you know, the average angler we get up there, we get everybody from a novice angler to, you know, um, you know, pretty experienced fly fishermen. Um, so never say never, but at this time we're, we're, we're not really considering because we're not managing for cutthroat trout there, but that could change. And, yeah, and there is a reduced bag on cutthroats. You know, you're allowed five trout, um, but only two cutthroats in the daily bag. So yeah, so, so it might, it might kind of confuse things up there, but we're, we're trying to keep it simple if we can. Okay. Um, here's another one regarding uh, the East Branch of the Verdigree. So a few years ago, uh, Trout Unlimited and Game and Parks did some stream reno uh, work over there. Are there any plans to continue with that project? We've actually got some rock stockpiled on site yet. And I thought uh, that some of the trout fishermen were going to add some rock to those structures. They've kind of melted away a little bit over time, or I shouldn't say melt away, sunk. <laughs> you know, that stream, it's amazing the sand load that it carries. And uh, yeah, we, we need to, to do a little work on the structures that we did put in. Um, a lot of the stream, pretty good habitat, pretty good natural habitat. Um, you know, we targeted that one area because it was kind of wide and shallow and we're gonna see what we could do. And believe it or not, when the vegetation comes on in that stream during the course of the summer, it changes the whole dynamics of the stream and, and improves the habitat. And we found actually that the trout numbers were higher in that time of year in other areas of the stream than the, than the, the, the reach of stream that we put the structures in. So the structures are more of a winter time thing and, but in answer to the question, yeah, we've got some rock on site. When we get a chance, the, the plans are to do some improvements up there again. Okay. Um, I'll stick with you, uh, Jeff. Any plans for a complete system renovation in the uh, Willow Lake drainage in Brown County? Um, we thought we had it cleaned out from Willow Lake upstream. Uh, right now, no, we don't have any plans to do, to do that watershed. Um, I'm really disappointed. I think we all are that we didn't get a complete kill at Willow Lake itself. Um, it, it would be a tough go to try to kill the carp out of that whole area out there. And, and right now, uh, especially with the high water that we've got would be impossible. Again, with that being said, I never say never. Get in a situation where we have some drought years and, and water levels really recede out there, that's the time to jump on it and get things done. And, you know, the wheels are always turning for us and, and Andy out there in that country that if we see an opportunity, we're going to jump on it. And if we think we can make some plans because that opportunity is coming up, we're going to make those plans. But right now, we don't have any plans for, for, for that area. Thank you. Uh, Tony, here's one for you. Hey, hey this, is, this is Andy and Bassett. Could I, I mean, uh, everybody hear me? Yep, go ahead, Andy. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, right now, we, we are in pretty good shape at at Willow Lake. We just got our, our perch are coming on, uh, the water are coming on. We're going to stock some more crappie to get them going. And the largemouth bass population is doing pretty good too. People are going down there in the spring and, and catch a magnum bass. So uh, there would be, uh, there, there's no need to get excited about doing anything there uh, until maybe we see a, a, a change in those fish populations. But right right now, it's in pretty good shape. Thanks, Andy. All right, uh, Tony, here's one for you. Um, 
what is the Game and Park's position on stocking fingerlings for stocking a more mature sized fish that could impact the fishery uh, sooner? Yeah, as, as Jeff alluded with, with some of the different stocking strategies that are just implemented in the Northeast District, um, it, it is very dependent on the situation. So we have, uh, we have fry stockings that do really well in certain reservoirs um, compared to fingerlings. And then, and then obviously in some of our smaller flood control reservoirs, these advanced fish do better. So it's, it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. Um, we're definitely with, with a lot of our research and, and population monitoring, we're, we're getting better and better at uh, being able to guide some of these strategies at specific water bodies to uh, decide on what that best strategy is. Is it the larger fish compared to the fingerling or fry, um, depending on the species? So. Um, that's why it's important for us to <clears throat> continue to get out there and, and monitor these, these different stockings. We do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of netting and pointed efforts to look at um, stocking success and survival and that sort of thing. So um, we, we, just to get into the specifics, we lean, we lean heavily on larger fish and some of our smaller flood control type reservoirs um, compared to others. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of those things we, that we continue to um, work on to help us guide, guide our management. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I'm gonna throw it back to you, uh, Jeff and Phil in North Fork. Uh, what is the outlook for bass at Buckskin Hills? Uh, they're looking for both numbers and numbers of larger size fish over five pounds. <laughs> over five pounds, big fish. <laughs> um, I think the numbers and size structure buckskin is going to be really good. That lake has, has maintained itself very well. I think it'll be another good year up there. Uh, every time we go up there and sample, we see lots of bass, good size structure. As far as bass, five pounds or bigger, uh, I don't know. We don't see a lot of them. We don't see a lot of fish that big in many of our lakes, but I can tell you a couple lakes where we do. Grove Lake and Maskentine are two lakes that, that um, if I was gonna fish for, for large bass, those are two of the lakes that I would hit. But you're gonna run across some at, at, at Buckskin. I, I just really don't have a real good feel for it because we just don't see a lot of fish that size up there. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll I'll leave this up to you. I'll maybe start with Tony and then let any of the other uh, uh, fish biologists uh, chime in with their with their thoughts. As this one's definitely open for uh, some difference of opinion. Um, what is a better fish to stock for controlling white perch and or yellow bass? Um, and uh, they asked musky or wipers. Uh, but if, if uh, anybody has any other ideas, go ahead and, uh, and jump in on that, that topic. I think uh, I, would, I would at least initially um, lean towards wipers just from the fact that the wipers would utilize a lot of the same um, habitat. And, um, you know, they're a pelagic fish, open water fish, just like a, a white perch and a yellow bass would be. So there would be that overlap in where they, they are at in a lake or reservoir where there could be those interactions. However, the wipers don't have a, as large of a gate size, so they would be limited as far as um, how big of yellow bass or, uh, or white perch they could eat, which would then entail that um, our muskie could do a better job at eating larger fish. Um, in either case, um, with, with some of the work that's been done and we've monitored populations over time at a number of reservoirs that have a white perch and yellow bass, we know that it is really hard to 
use biological control, use predators to actually make meaningful impacts on those on those populations of aquatic invasive species. So um, it's one of those things that it it's one of the tools in the toolbox, but it it doesn't always uh, get the job done for structuring those populations of uh, invasive fish species. Well, that's a good answer, Tony. I think I'll chime in just a little bit. As we deal with white perch in a lot of the sand pits down at Fremont, and particularly on private lakes down there, um, and we see some rather large white perch, and generally are associated with lakes that are clear, have vegetation in them, and have an abundant bass population. So it appears that actually largemouth bass do a good job of controlling yellow perch and sand pits, that, or excuse me, white perch in sand pit situations, and in in lakes say in Iowa that I'm familiar with, with, with yellow bass, it's kind of the same situation that I've observed. Muskies are hard on other species. As muskies grow in size, they're gonna look for a larger predator. Yellow bass in particular, a 10 inch yellow bass is, is in Iowa's master angler. You know, I'm not real familiar with them, but in Iowa, they're, that 10 inches is a, is a master angler. That's not a very big fish, really. You know, they're nice, but, but um, uh, so I think, I think the key to controlling some of the white perch and the yellow bass, if they get in some of our lakes, is maintaining our good water quality and habitat and maintaining those bass populations. Yeah. And then I'll chime in as well. My name is Chris Starr. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager. Um, part of the reason white perch are so destructive um, is first is they spawn a lot of eggs. So the typical one pound largemouth bass um, lays about 4,000 eggs a year. Um, one white perch lays about 150,000. So we're talking a, a greater of, on far magnitude more than our native fish. Um, also white perch eat about everything, including fish eggs. So they directly impact our sport fish populations through that way. So yeah, it's always, you know, make sure you know what you're I'm catching in your lakes using this bait, so. Yeah, just to kind of wrap up the point on that, um, UNL did a study a few years ago uh, looking at what, uh, it was specifically at Branch Stoke and Pawnee uh, in the Southeast District down by Lincoln, but kind of looking at what uh, the most effective predators were in those water bodies. And they found that um, walleye and largemouth bass were actually the most effective at uh, predating on on those white perch. So um, th those would probably be a little bit more uh, in, in line with predate, you know, providing some predation pressure on, on that white perch. But as everybody else has alluded to, um, providing control is probably not uh, going to happen. Uh, for this next question, I'm going to throw it back to uh, Chris. Uh, so in uh, spraying off your boat uh, in regards to uh, AIS, do you just spray it off with water or do you use soap or is something else more effective? I guess how, how would uh, you go about uh, deconning your boat or what's, uh, what do our anglers need to know before going to the next water body? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for zebra mussels, to kill zebra mussels, both adults and larvae, the water needs to be 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's, you know, you want to use a hot water um, to kill zebra mussels, both adults um, and juveniles. So um, the biggest thing is to make sure that your boat is deconned, like I said, you know, you, you know, using that hot water or let it dry completely before taking it to the next water body. If you, I mean, if you're putting it um, in another water body than you launched before. So uh, zebra mussel larvae called velagers are microscopic and invisible to the naked eye, and they can actually live in a drop of water. Um, and in cooler water temperatures, they can live up to four weeks um, in your boat, just in your bilge or, or something like that. And zebra mussels can live that long as well um, with, um, without water. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very critical that you clean, drain, dry your boat, you know, make sure you use that hot water. 
Um, in addition, vinegar um, can be used uh, to spray down your boat to kill uh, microscopic zebra mussels as well. So yeah, it's very, very important to use hot water, but make sure you, 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 you never transport water um, from one water body to another. So yeah, if it's actually against our state um, um, regulations, so. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to keep you on here. So uh, Jeff talked about uh, moving crayfish earlier. What problems do uh, these invasive crayfish cause if they were to be moved? Oh, they are incredibly disruptive. So, um, you know, they um, most of our invasive crayfish, like the rusties, uh, the rusty crayfish are are incredibly more aggressive than our native uh, crayfish and they grow larger. So they're able to outcompete our native uh, crayfish for food, but also consume them and kill them outright. So that's a big problem. Um, our larger crayfish, you know, um, on the invasive side can kill, you know, small fish um, and compete with some of our other native species for uh, food and cover. Um, they also destroy aquatic vegetation, which is incredibly important um, to both our sport and native fish. So yeah, they're, they're, they're very destructive and they I should not be moved um, at all, so. Oh, and for more information, uh, you can contact um, a Game and Parks at ngpc.mais uh, at nebraska.gov for more on, on questions and sightings, so thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I know you put that uh, information, that contact info in the uh, the group chat as well for anybody that's interested in uh, or anybody that sees anything or just wants more information. Uh, throw this back to the Norfolk guys. Can you discuss the musky population at Calamus a little bit? Um, I don't think you guys probably have population estimates, but maybe talk about relative abundance, um, angler success, and just uh, overall size of the fish up there. Yeah, we don't have any hard data, Jordan, you're right. But we feel we've got a good population of muskies in there. We stock them every other year. Uh, I believe it's just a thousand every other year. Anglers do catch them and target them at Calamus certain times of the year better than others. We do see quite a few musky when we're collecting gizzard shad uh, in the spring of the year uh, in the Gracie Creek area and Valley View area at Calamus. Uh, pretty impressive size. Phil, do you remember what they went up to last year? I don't know if we saw 40, one. It's quite 50, but 48, 49 it, Yeah, inches. 48, so 49 inches. We've seen them Pretty, pretty good numbers of them from about 36 to 45 inches anyway, and get several in the boat. We're discussing how to come up with a good method to get our hands on them, to get an actual sample and get some annual data on them. And it may involve nighttime gill netting like, uh, like they do at Merritt during walleye spawn. Uh, but our feeling is we've got good numbers of them up there. People do catch them. We see a lot of them caught including down by Nunda Shoals from bank fishermen. And uh, um, we think they're doing very well. I just wish we had some good hard numbers on them. We do have lengths on them when we catch them. Incidentally, we try to get them in the boat and get some lengths and weights on them. So we do have, have some information on them. Sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. Hey, this is Andy up in Bassett. I've 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 been down there trying pretty regular for the last couple of years, but I've I've actually known people and seen pictures of fish in excess of fifty inches down there. So they have some big fish, maybe not the numbers that that Merritt might hold because it's got a little more deeper water refuge, but uh, there it it's a it's a fantastic fishery. Thanks, guys. Um... We'll stick with you guys up there. Uh, next question is regarding spotted bass in Davis Creek. Um, any sign of them? You guys seen any? Look for them at all? We've been looking for them. We didn't see much for return on them. Uh, we, 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 we've seen them as juveniles, we think, um, but they're kind of hard to distinguish at that size. 
to some degree, but, um, but beyond the juvenile age zero, age one, you're not seeing much. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think the experiment's over. Uh, we're seeing largemouth bass, we're not seeing the, the spots. So uh, we gave it a shot, we stalked them for several years, they didn't seem to take. So I think that experiment's over. Okay. All right, uh, this one is uh, for Tony. This is regarding uh, the possibility of getting hot sea machines, which we use for decontaminating boats if we need uh, to and we run into potential AIS issues. Any possibility or what's the outlook of possibly getting those at every major lake or fishing location to help stop the spread uh, before we get uh, problems and before we can do anything about it? In theory, we would love that. We would love to have um, these units as well as trained personnel to be there to uh, actually um, do the decon decontaminations. Um, it's, it's not as simple as just spraying your boat and you're done. You know, these hot to units, like Chris stated earlier, we require at least 140 degree water. Um, if there's, if there's things stuck on your boat and that sort of thing, high pressure, um, and they're, they can be very dangerous. So, um, we go through, our staff goes through a couple day training just to be able to know how to uh, decontaminate boats properly and follow the correct protocols. So um, ideally we'd love to have, have the funding available to buy these units, um, staff them with personnel. Um, but right now we just aren't at that point. Um, and Chris, you can, you can chime in uh, as well if you have some other additional thoughts. Yeah, no, that's great, Tony. Yeah, um, in the future, that's something we'll definitely look at, you know, so we can find some extra funding or some of a, some other avenues like that. Maybe that's something we can consider in the future. But like Tony said, the logistics right now, um, it makes it hard. But that's something that we'll look at for sure, so. All right, we'll go back to the Norfolk guys on this next one. Uh, have you seen any improvements on uh, the size structure of panfish at Powder Creek after the drawdown? Bill, you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, we're not seeing a whole lot of eight inches yet, but we are seeing that shift up finally. You know, a lot of years there, we weren't seeing, you know, we were hard pressed to see much for bluegill over uh, six, six and a half inches, but we have shifted up. Um, got a, we have a fair number of, you know, those seven, seven and a half inchers. Um, it's still kind of early, you know, that was just a year and a half ago or so that we did that, but we're going to continue looking at that uh, lake, both looking at the bass population, which is really what we needed to really turn around up there. Our recruitment's been really poor on them, and we need a high, no, relatively high numbers of bass to stay on top of those bluegill, and and uh, promote their growth by thinning them out a little bit. Um, so it's getting better. Uh, not quite there where we'd like to be yet, but uh, things are looking up so far. Uh, we'll stick with you guys. How big are the yellow bass in Summit? And uh, I guess just talk about their population right now uh, in general. I'm trying to remember the, what the lengths were on. Do you remember what, what we did were? see some nicer ones? I think we may have seen them up to 11 inches or so on the big end, not a lot of those. Um, but any, anywhere from five or six inches up to that 10, 11 inch mark. Um, and I, I'd characterize their numbers as fairly low yet. They had been low. That's why it's kind of an eye opener this past spring when we were electro fishing. And we got around one of the breakwaters and probably hit a spawning concentration is what happened, but they were extremely numerous. And they outnumbered our bass at that particular station, our largemouth bass. And, uh, but that was, that was just one station out of several. 
but we did pick them up occasionally. So they went from, you know, hey, what's this kind of fish? You get a you get a picture and a text of, to, you know, okay, they're they're catching a few more, and now this is the first time in one of our lect fishing samples where we've actually seen, you know, a little higher number of them. I'm not ready to hit the panic button yet, but I certainly wish they weren't in there. And there's only one way they got in there, and that's somebody put them in. And either they were using them for bait or decided they went somewhere and caught them, or I don't know why people move fish around, but I wish they wouldn't have done it. But uh, all, all we can do right now is monitor the situation, see what happens. But I tell people, if you catch them, take them home. They're good eating. You know, get them out of the lake. Might as well utilize them. So hopefully they're not going to cause us major problems in there. Uh, we still got an abundant bass population, great size structure. So um, hopefully they can stay on top of those um, yellow bass like they do the bluegill and the crappie and we'll have a, a good size structure on them. At least you can utilize them. Hope they don't ruin the lake. Thank you. Um, a couple questions regarding Fremont. So the first, any word on how the muskie are doing in Fremont 20 after the flood? And then kind of a follow-up to that, when is the, or what's the plans for redoing Lake 16 and 20 at Fremont? We saw some muskie after the flood. They made it through, some of them did. However, that was only two or three that we got our hands on. So they're still in there. The problem is the lake's full of carp, buffalo, white perch, a lot of undesirable shad. species with a shad, a handful of bass and bluegill. Uh, yeah, we've got those lakes on the renovation list. Probably going to have to wait until, <laughs> I hate to say it, but after Labor Day because it's a high use park area. Been in discussion with some of the park people about it. I think they'd prefer if we'd wait till after Labor Day. So it looks like a fall renovation and restocking. Also, they're not completely done with restoring Lake 20 yet. They're still working on, on the road around the east end, trying to restore that. So when, when they get some of that done uh, this summer and get that all finished up, we'll be ready to go. And um, uh, Lake 16, we're gonna try to do some salvage work in. There's still some good fish in there, but the handwriting's on the wall is full of rough fish too. So, and again, that'll be after Labor Day. Um, so smallmouth do pretty well in the Missouri River. Are there any plans to move smallies into any of your smaller lakes in the district up there? Not at this time. Uh, we've tried some smallies in lakes over the years, over the decades, and typically find out that largemouth bass outcompete them. With, with the exception of really one lake, and that's Lake Yankton. Um, following the 2014 renovation, smallmouth bass got back in there, probably came down from the, from the Yankton hatchery, the Gav or Gavin's Point hatchery. Um, but they're very specific to where we find them in that lake, and that's on the rocks off of White Crane. So if you want to catch smallies, go to the rocks off White Crane or, or two of the rock jetties in the lake. That's about the only place we see smallies. But uh, yeah, they, they thrive in the Missouri River, but when we put them in a, say, a flood control reservoir situation, um, especially if there's some largemouth bass in that system, we, we notice that the largemouth bass outcompete them. So, uh, no, we've got a good smallmouth fishery, Lewis and Clark Lake and the upper Missouri River. And uh, I think if people want to catch smallies, that's where they should go target smallies. They'll do well. Okay. Um, I guess another one for, for Jeff and Phil. What is the best lake to catch big bullheads in Northeast Nebraska? Uh, big ones? Where do we see the biggest bullheads? Well, big ones we see at Summit and Maple Creek, uh, but pretty low density, but they're actual, they're absolute beasts if you run across one in there. Um, you know, pound and a half. Got We've been seeing up to two pounds. Um, numbers wise, I guess I'd probably look at Swan Lake and Powder Creek. Yeah, this, Powder this, Creek. Yeah, this, is, 
This is Andy, Monster Bullheads in Willow Lake, Brown County. You can catch them just about walk up to the boat ramp and throw a worm out as far as you can on the bottom, and you'll catch them. So, and, and it'd be good for them to go away because the bass are controlling the the upcoming year classes. But there are some there are some big bullheads in Willow Lake. There you go. It's ways out there, but have at it. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. We have just a couple more questions here that were uh, sit in, sent in prior to the meeting. Um, Jeff, you might know this one. Um, has there been any discussion between Iowa, the Corps and Nebraska in regards to opening Omidia Bend uh, in regards to dredging that out? Uh, any ideas on that? Or I guess, uh, Kirk, you might know too. I guess you're on here Kirk with the Missouri on, River, yeah. uh, Mo River program. Yeah, is, is Kirk on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Gentlemen. I'm here. Um, I'm not aware of that being on the course priority list. Um, I think it's one of those projects that's on the radar um, with the FY21 operations funds that the core got, they are prioritizing um, restoring some of the chute and backwater habitats. And most of that work is being done below the Platte River and then into like the Missouri reach of the river. Unless it gets to the point that it starts affecting any navigation I don't think that's going to be moved up the priority list. All right. Thank you. And we had one more that was sent in prior to the meeting. Uh, this is in regards to our NDEE partners and the draft of the Nebraska Clean Water Report. Uh, that had the majority of our lakes and rivers being seriously impaired. Uh, Tony, I'm going to ask you to comment on this. What is being done to clean up our waters? Who has statutory authority to stop up upstream polluters? And um, they mentioned Willow Creek as being uh in poor condition, but uh, many of our, our water bodies can also be affected on this that that game and parks manages. Yeah, I can I can start here and then obviously we have some others that are on the call that can help out. Um, but but really uh, our issues. Yeah, there there are a lot of water bodies where we have uh, that are impaired for a number of different reasons, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, um, chemicals, atrazine, or, or um, harmful algal blooms and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> we, we continue to work, um, and Mark Porath can probably um, take over on some of this with the Aquatic Habitat Program, but we continue to work with NDE, um, the NRCS, a lot of different partners to help uh, look at best management practices within these watersheds to help protect um, and basically uh, do our best to uh, filter out a lot of the sedimentation and nutrient inputs into, uh, into our lakes and reservoirs prior to them getting into the um, lake proper. Um, statutory, uh, what was the question, Jordan, about who is, uh, who's uh, responsible for the... Uh, so who has statutory pollution? authority to, to stop upstream polluters or who more or less who, who can work on the upstream uh, portions of those projects. Um, you know, we, Mark, you can jump in on this too in our aquatic habitat project. We, we do a lot of work in reservoir, but it doesn't do a whole lot of good just to work in reservoir if nothing can be done in the watershed to, uh, to stop all that, all the stuff from coming in. Yeah, that's very true. And 
I'm not real familiar with NDE's regulatory or statutory authorities, uh, but a lot of it will depend on whether it's a point source or a non-point source. And most of the stuff that we are dealing with when we're talking on a watershed scale is non-point source, which means there's not a pipe getting place with stuff coming out. It's just generally over the, the surface of the watershed. One of the challenges we're really facing is that most of the heavy sedimentation uh, it occurs a little bit all the time, but a big chunk of it has already occurred, and there, that material is already in our reservoirs or it's in our creek channels. And now when we have these great big runoff events, uh, what's in the creek channels gets transported into the, the water, uh, our reservoirs in particular. So a lot of times we still want to encourage best manager practices in the fields and everything above um, and upstream in the watershed. But a lot of times we're still going to, have to deal with it in the stream channel itself or in the reservoir. And we generally do that by trying to uh, stop the sedimentation and then control the nutrients that are going to come out of that nutrientation, usually with sediment traps, off channel retention ponds, uh, stuff like that. All right, very good. Thank you, guys. I believe. And Jordan, uh, you yep. got a minute here. I yeah, like go to ahead, plug Jeff. in for uh, Jeff Blauser with the Private Waters. Um, as been alluded to the uh, first part of the discussion, if you have some questions in regards to private water management, whether it's uh, construction, stocking, uh, management, and so forth, they can sure give me a call. Uh, the district guys, uh, I rely on them quite a bit on areas too and so forth, but if they want to talk to me about some uh, private water management, they sure can do that. And best number to get a hold of me would be the 402-499-4041 or uh, email me jeff.blazer. That was a, that's with the S at nebraska.gov. So either way of those two, they can sure give me a call. We can talk about various stockings and so forth too. So. I just put a link to our uh, private waters program in the uh, chat. So I believe- Sounds good. Yeah, Jeff, your contact info should be, yeah, it's it's in there. So if anybody needs to get a hold of Jeff or wants to, to chat about uh, their pond, um, yep. Jeff's always happy and to I chat on to the do, phone, so. I meant to do that last night and I didn't get the chance to up, uh, jump in there and do that, so. Uh, uh, that's why people tonight can have a chance to give me a call too if they like. Yeah, he's Jeff's always happy to pick up the phone and chat with you. So, all right, anybody else got any any comments? We appreciate all the the input from everybody. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to uh, Tony and Dean. Yeah, just want to thank everybody once again for uh, for coming on today. Um, as Dean mentioned at the start, and, and Jeff during his presentation, these these types of meetings are 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 great for for us as uh, as a fisheries division to hear from our anglers and 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 really uh, get an idea on what's going on out there, what the concerns are, uh, questions, and that sort of thing. It it, it really helps us out. Um, and it's a great, great tool for us to uh, be able to guide our management as we as we move forward and try to improve these fisheries. So, um, just a huge thanks for everybody uh, being on, taking the time to to hear what we have to say. Again, I'll kind of just echo Tony's remarks there on thanking everybody. I want to thank the guys from law enforcement and wildlife for joining us tonight. And uh, all the fisheries guys, uh, great job. Really appreciate it. And if you guys uh, have any questions for the guys, make sure you get a hold of them. Uh, call the main office if nothing else. Uh, we're always happy to help out and answer any questions we can. Uh, looking forward to a great year of fishing. And uh, hopefully everybody can get out there and have some fun. Take somebody fishing. Enjoy. Thanks, guys. <laughs>